Hello everyone, it's Luke Kennedy again and it's great to be back with you for Learning at Home TV. Coming up in our Year 3 and 4 English lesson, we'll learn about quest stories. You can also prepare to explore some mathematical language and science is about making observations about heat. So get comfortable and ready your minds to learn. Who doesn't love a good adventure story? A hero, a villain, a journey to a mysterious land, and a prize or reward by the end. Today, Pascal is going to take a look at quest stories and the features that make them so exciting and entertaining to read and view. Hello. Today, we are going on an adventure to find out what exactly is a quest story. Do you know what a quest story is? Perhaps you have read one and you didn't even know it. To go on our adventure, we will need to use our imaginations because quest stories are imaginative narrative texts. Well, our first stop is to remember what a narrative text is. That's right, a narrative text tells a story. It describes characters that go through a series of events or experiences, real or imagined. Do you remember the structure of a narrative? Yes, most narratives have a beginning or an orientation, which introduces the setting, the main characters, and creates a mood or feeling for the story. Then there is the complication, which is a problem or conflict that needs to be solved. And then, of course, there is a resolution where the complication is resolved. The build-up of a complication or complications in a narrative is called plot tension. It helps to keep the reader wondering what is going to happen next, maintaining their interest. You might remember this diagram that shows the structure of a narrative. It shows the rising and falling action of a narrative, starting with the orientation, rising up to the complication, and then falling to the resolution. Narratives often have a theme. Remember that a theme is the main idea or message of a text. Sometimes the message is quite obvious and in other stories, the reader may be left to wonder what they learned from the story. So now that we remember what a narrative is, how does this help us with quest stories? What exactly is a quest story? What is a quest? Did you know that some synonyms for quest are adventure, journey, and mission? Maybe that will give us a clue. A quest story includes adventure, action, interesting characters, mythical creatures, excitement, and a journey. A quest story is a literary text where the main character goes on an adventurous journey and is met with a series of problems or obstacles which they overcome. By the end of the quest, the character returns with a solution to the problem and the benefits of knowledge gained through the journey. By the way, the character that completes the quest is often the one who seems like the most unlikely hero. What other features are there? Quest stories are highly imaginative. They are sometimes set in imaginary worlds of the past or the future with fantastic mythical creatures. Their themes are often about good overcoming bad. The series of obstacles to overcome might be tests to be challenged by, riddles to be solved, or missions to be completed. Another aspect of quest stories is how the main character develops throughout the story. At first, they might seem shy or scared, like they might not be able to complete the quest. But by the end of the story, through the challenges they have to overcome, the way they see themselves and the way others see them transforms. They are seen as strong and heroic. Now that you have an understanding of the features of quest stories, I bet you have read or seen at least one quest story before. Can you think of a book or a film that could be called a quest story? We're going to read the beginning of a quest story now, an ebook called The Cauldron of Tamui. Let's see whether it introduces some of the important features of a quest story in its orientation. Long ago, in the land of Tamui, 
legend told of a lost magical cauldron buried deep in an enchanted forest. According to the legend, if the cauldron could be returned to its rightful owner, no one would ever be hungry again. Kadafin and Oshi lived on opposite sides of the enchanted forest. Both had heard this legend for as long as they could remember. So, from the very first page, we can see that this story is set in the past in an imaginary land called Tamui. It starts with long ago, and the illustrations look very different from the modern cities and towns of today. We know it is imaginary because there's an enchanted forest. Let's check. What does enchanted mean? Enchanted can be used in many ways, but in this instance, it means the forest has been placed under a spell. The legend of the magical cauldron could have something to do with the quest, don't you think? Let's keep going and find out who Kadafin and Oshi are. Even though she knew it inside and out, Oshi never tired of listening to the elders tell the story of the magical cauldron. While Oshi listened, she could escape from her world where her village was poor and her sister and brothers often went to bed hungry. Meanwhile, on the other side of the enchanted forest, little Kadafin was equally fascinated by the tale and would often ask Inra, the wisest elder, to repeat it. The people in Kadafin's village were also very poor and his family were often hungry. He longed for the day when everyone would once again have plenty to eat and nothing to worry about. One afternoon, after hearing the tale for the umpteenth time, Kadafin suddenly decided that he would find the magical cauldron. When he told his sisters his plan, they laughed. Marla said, there is no cauldron, you silly fool, so don't waste everyone's time. Kafreen agreed with her sister. You're too small and weak. You wouldn't even make it to the first peach tree. Stop daydreaming and go help mum, ordered his oldest sister, Dara. These cruel comments only made Kadafin more determined. He made up his mind to leave early the next morning. Do you think that Kadafin and Oshi could be our unlikely heroes? We're introduced to the characters who are described as poor, hungry, silly, small, weak, and daydreamers. These sound like all the right ingredients for unlikely heroes to me. Well, sadly, our adventure is over for today. But so far, I think this does sound like the beginning of a wonderful quest story. I wonder what will happen next. If you want to find out what happens to Kadafin and Oshi on their quest, ask your teacher if they can help you find the ebook story of The Cauldron of Tamui. Why don't you find a quest story or movie to read or view? They are often long, so you might have to tackle it over a number of days. Look closely at how the unlikely hero of the quest story overcomes obstacles on their journey and is rewarded by the end. Did the reward come at a heavy price? How does the character develop throughout their journey? Well, that's it for today. Bye for now. Now it's time for maths, and this lesson will help us to navigate maps. Some businesses provide their customers with a map to get to their store. Shopping centres provide plans and maps so that we can find the specific shop we need. Being able to follow maps and give directions from them is a really important skill. So Annie is going to help us with that. Hi. In today's lesson, we will use mathematical language to find locations and describe pathways. First though, let's do a recap of directions and compass points because we're going to use them later on. Today, we're going to be using our left and right. For a quick reminder, this is your left and this is your right. 
Now look at this clock. When the hands of the clock move, like this, they move to the right. We call this direction clockwise. This is the way the hands of a clock normally move. When the hands of the clock move like this, to the left, we call this anti-clockwise. This means the opposite direction is anti-clockwise. I want you to imagine a big clock on the floor and you are standing in the very middle. 12 o'clock would be right in front of you, where I am. 3 o'clock is to your right, 6 o'clock is directly behind you and 9 o'clock is to your left. Let's play a game to see how well you can remember where 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock and 9 o'clock are. I want you to turn clockwise around your imaginary clock as I say the time. Ready? 12 o'clock. Are you looking at me? 3 o'clock. Are you facing to the right? 6 o'clock. Are you facing away from me? 9 o'clock. Are you facing to your left? And 12 o'clock. I hope you're looking back at me. We just used a clock to describe directions. We can also do this with compass points. Do you remember the compass points? They are north, east, south and west. Most maps have compass points on them, but some only have north. This is okay because once you know where north is, you can always find the other compass points. Let's play the same game we just played with our imaginary clock on the floor with one small change. This time, I want you to imagine that you're on a map and north is right ahead of you, where I am, in the TV. East will be to your right, south will be behind you and west will be to your left. I'm going to say a compass point and you're going to face in that direction. Ready? North. Are you facing me? East. Are you facing to the right? South. Are you facing away from me? West. Are you facing to the left? And finally, north. You're facing me again. When we use compass points on a map, the map is normally drawn so that north points to the top. To help me remember my compass points, I say the sentence, never eat slimy worms. It really helps me to get the directions in the right order. There are in-between compass points too. If I'm facing north and I turn to the east and stop halfway, that compass point is called northeast. It's a little bit north and a little bit east. If I'm facing east and I turn to the south, and stop halfway, it's called southeast. And if I'm facing south and I turn to the west halfway, it's called southwest. And if I'm facing west and I turn to the north halfway, it's called northwest. Did you notice that all our in between compass points start with either north or south? Let's use our compass directions to navigate a map. When we find our way from one place to another, we are navigating. Let's look at this map of a classroom and talk about some of the features that help us to navigate. Notice how the map is a grid. The grid helps us measure distances between objects on the map so we can work out the distances in real life. It shows which way is north with a red compass arrow. And I know we can easily find the other points now. It has a legend to describe the symbols represented on the map. And it has a scale that tells us how big the measurements are in real life. The scale on this map tells us that one centimetre on the map equals one metre in real life. This is a map of a bike path but it's missing one very important feature. Let's work out what's missing. 
we can see a grid to help us measure distances. There is a compass direction showing north. There is a scale where one square represents one metre in real life. Can you see what is missing? It's missing a legend to describe what the icons or symbols represent. This is not a big deal because we can probably work them out. Let's see. Hmm, there's an icon showing two people together. This is very familiar. I've seen this before to represent toilets. So this must be the location of the toilets on the bike path. This icon looks like a bowl on a stand with water splashing in it. I wonder what it could be. It could be a bird bath or a basin to wash your hands or a bubbler for cyclists to get a drink or even a fountain. What do you think it's likely to be? It's most likely a bubbler for thirsty cyclists. The only way to know for sure is to follow the bike path and see what it is. This is why this map needs a legend. The map also has two symbols that look like little hills and they are right in the middle of the path. This gives me a clue to what the icon represents. A little hill on a path could be a speed bump, so that's my guess. OK, now I think we are ready for a real map. This is a map of a suburb called East Brisbane. You can see the name of the suburb in blue writing. It's the biggest writing on the map, so we know it's the name of an area. We've got some instructions to get from Cooparoo State College at A to a friend's house in La Trobe Street marked B on this map. Follow along with the instructions to see how it matches the path we need to take to get from A to B. Go southeast until you get to Stanley Street East. Remember, southeast is in between south and east. Turn right into Stanley Street East. Walk west along Stanley Street until you get to Wellington Road. Turn right into Wellington Road. Walk north along Wellington Road until you get to Lytton Road. Turn right into Lytton Road. Walk east along Lytton Road until you see La Trobe Street on your right. Turn right into La Trobe Street and finally walk south along La Trobe Street until you get to your destination. Today, we learnt about directions using a clock face and compass points. We also used features of maps and compass points to navigate from one place to another. Wow, we managed to fit a lot into today's lesson. Why don't you try drawing a map and writing a list of steps to get from your home to your school or another familiar place, like the nearest park or your friend's house? Don't forget to make sure your map has a legend. See you next time. There are lots of fun games that you can create once you are able to draw your own maps, like hiding something in your backyard and having a friend follow your instructions to find it. Now it's time to meet someone new who's going to share a story with us about their life and their community. from the Ganglir and Garawa tribe of Bumaji, farm of Queensland. Uh, in the morning I do radio session from 8 to 11, Black Star Radio. Um, we do stuff like give shout outs and all the announcements. Um, yeah, let, let the people know what's going on in our community. Yeah, here I am at the school, uh, just in the man arts class. Um, today we, we're talking about uh, making, making a boomerang, different stages. So this this the piece we cut cut out the piece of the boomerang and um, yeah the next step after that we we put some yeah put some um, varnish it varnish it up make it look good here we are what what what, uh, what I did you reduce um, this one here it's the it's the raw one straight off the tree and then we move along um, this one here was the first coat yeah here we are down the waterfall uh, one of the famous locals attraction down here. Um, as you can see behind me, that's, we call it the boy head. We like to come down here and fishing. It's very famous during the flood, but uh, yeah, as you can see, it's a bit dry now.
The My Place competition is back for 2020. This year, the Australian Children's Television Foundation and the Australian Literacy Educators Association are calling on students in years three to 10 to create stories about your place in this historically significant time. The coronavirus pandemic has reshaped our lives and historians of the future will want to know how this looked and felt for you, your family and your community. The 2020 My Place competition asks you to reflect on this moment in time and share your thoughts, observations and experiences through creative writing. Entries can be uploaded until the 26th of June, so there's still time to get involved. Welcome back. Have you ever been so cold that you were shivering? Or have you ever touched something so hot that it burned your skin? The amount of heat around us makes a big difference, whether we have too much or not enough. Just like in the fairy tale when Goldilocks was tasting the three bears bowls of porridge, we need to have just the right amount of heat. Today in science, we're starting to investigate heat. Here's David to show us some ways we can observe it. Hi. Today, we're going to make some observations about heat. Let's start with what we're noticing right now about heat. Are you feeling a bit chilly today? Or maybe you're feeling a little bit too hot. Are you in a warm or a cool part of your home? Where could you go to get warmer or cooler? If you did that, how could you tell which places have more or less heat? probably use one of your senses. You could feel whether it was warmer or cooler. So let's explore what our senses can tell us about heat. You might hear the crackling of a fire or the sizzle of a sausage on a barbecue. Maybe you heard the cracking sound of a tin roof on a hot day. We've all heard our parents warn us about hot things. Have you been told not to touch the stove or the iron or to stay away from a fire? We can observe the effects of heat using other senses apart from hearing. Now, our sense of touch can tell us if something is warmer or cooler than our body. I'm going to show you some examples, but maybe you could close your eyes instead just for now and remember or imagine how each of these things feel. Walking on hot sand and feeling the heat through your feet. Eating a hot chip and feeling the heat in your mouth. Maybe it burnt your tongue. Sitting in a warm bath on a cold day and feeling the heat all over your body. Okay, open your eyes now. We can't see heat, but sometimes we can tell that something's hot by looking at it. If we see a fire, then we know it'll be hot like a campfire or the flame on a gas stove. If we see smoke, we know something's hot enough to burn. If we see water bubbling with steam, then we know that it's starting to boil and that means it's very hot. What about when you breathe out in the really cold morning air or maybe onto a glass window? Sometimes you see something that looks like steam. It's not, it's fog, but it tells us that our breath is warmer than the air. Sometimes another sign of heat is that something can change colour. Like my fingers turn pale when they're losing heat and getting cold in winter. Wood glows red in the fire. Someone in your home might even have a mug that changes colour when you pour a hot drink into it. Some materials like metals start to glow red when they're really hot. Sometimes we can even smell that something's hot if it's burning or smoking or melting because of the heat. I can smell when my toast has been heating for too long inside the toaster, even if I can't see it. Now, what about the sense of taste? 
Can we use that to notice heat? We might say something tastes hot if we have a food with chilli or pepper in it, but that's a different kind of heat. That's not heat energy. That kind of heat is from chemicals in the spices that make your mouth feel like it's burning. It's the same with really minty flavours. If you breathe in, your mouth can feel cold. Sometimes we feel like it's a cold burn, but it's not really about heat. OK, so we've thought a lot about using our senses to observe the effects of heat. But where does the heat come from? Most of it comes from the sun. It shines on the earth to make it just the right temperature for us to live here. Although sometimes in winter, we'd like a little bit more heat. And other times in summer, we think there's a bit too much. There's other natural sources of heat too. There's a huge amount of heat in volcanoes and hot springs under the, from under the ground. And heat's also made when we compost our grass clippings and food scraps and they break down. We can make a bit of heat ourselves when we need it. Thousands of years ago, people learnt how to make fires for cooking and keeping warm. More recently, scientists have learnt how to make heat with electricity, like my toaster or my iron. You can make, make heat just by rubbing your hands together. Rub them for a bit until you can really feel some heat. Now, it's time to look back on what we learnt today. We now know that, first, we can observe the effects of heat energy using our senses. Two, heat energy mostly comes from the sun, but there are some ways that we can make heat. Here's something that you could try later. If it's a nice sunny day, go for a walk outside. Use your sense of touch to see how much the sun has heated different materials. You might find some things have become quite warm. Other things don't have much heat at all. Can you predict which ones will have the most heat from the sun? See what you can find out, and I'll see you next time. It's now time to take a brain break and activate your bodies. And we have a special guest from the Queensland Firebirds netball team to show you some moves. So please stand up and get ready to begin while I say goodbye. The upper primary kids will be sitting in on their lessons next. So bye for now. Hi guys, my name is Romelda Aiken and I'm from the Queensland Firebirds. I hope you guys are staying healthy at home because active living is so much fun. Today we're going to take you through three exercises and the first, that, the first one that we're going to do is a squat jump. Okay, make sure your feet are shoulder width apart and we're going to push up, reach for the skies and down, up to the sky. The second exercise we're going to do is a bit of a lunging exercise. So we're going to take the ball and we're going to catch it out here. So we're going to make sure that we come back shoulder width apart, all the way out. Good job. All right. The other exercise that we're going to do is overhead pass. So we're going to take the ball over the top and point forward. All the way out, all the way out. Good job. Good job, girls and boys. Make sure you stay healthy at home and make sure you stay active.